Um, first of all, welcome to uh, the German African Safaris Guided Group, uh, Guided Group Safaris 2020 webinar. My name is Pierce Sinnott. I've been with German African Safari since early 2017, and I am the marketing specialist, um, which means that I support our agents and operators um, based in UK, Ireland, uh, France, the Nordic countries, and the Benelux countries. Okay, just a quick introduction to myself. Now, today I'm just going to run through, um, really giving you a, an introduction to our guided group safaris. Obviously, in half an hour, I can't do everything, but hopefully I'll give you an overview of what it's about, the vehicles we use, um, the accommodation, etc. And then we'll have a look at a few of the, well, three of the, the main itineraries or some of the best selling itineraries that we have. And then I'll finish off quickly with a, just a very quick couple of words on the Grow Africa Foundation, which is our, our in-house um, charitable foundation. Okay, a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, you will see in the bottom right, there is a chat pod. And if you would like to have, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in there. I'm not gonna stop the presentation as we go, but uh, rather at the end of it all, uh, I'll come back and, and try and answer any questions that I can at that stage. Okay, so if everyone's happy with that, I'll, um, I'll, I'll start the presentation. That's right. Okay, so to start off with, um, Gentleman African Safaris, uh, this is really where we are and what we do. If you can see down below, around here is Cape Town, so that's where the head office is. We've got a staff of plus minus 70 or so people there, which is all the admin, reservations, um, marketing accounts, etc., including our own workshop. We've then got in Botswana, operational office, again in uh, Vic Falls, and then Arusha and Tana. So all the shaded areas you see there in the, the yellow, red, and blue are the areas we operate in. Who is, uh, who or who are German African Safaris? Uh, on the left here, we've got Garth. He's the, the founder of German African Safaris, and that was over 25 years ago. And then we've got, who hope I'm sure many of you will know already, Katja who is now the CEO of Gentleman African Safari. So she's the, the one in charge and running the show, super dynamic uh, from German origin and uh, is our, our matriarch, I suppose. On the other side here, we are speaking about guided groups. So this is the guided groups team. Many of you will already be familiar with, with Lisa. So they're the two main consultants who will handle the bulk of, the, uh, um, of your inquiries. They're then supported by Anika, who is the guide coordinator. And then there's Zaini and Geneva, who are both um, tour coordinators. So they basically help Kyle and Lisa organizing, doing all the, all the graft behind the scenes. Finally, over on the left, we've got Peter, who's our new head of sales. Now, he came in a few months ago and I think is doing a super job. He's shaking up the departments a little bit um, and hopefully improving things as, as we go. Quickly touching on the vehicles. Um, at present, we have a fleet of about 20 or so vehicles. And the sprinters here is what we're moving towards. So at the moment, the fleet there, there is also some other vehicles, but uh, looking forward, um, you can expect more sprinters coming online and that's already started to happen. And the reasons for that, I will go through now in just a couple of minutes. But uh, the sprinter is really the workhorse of, of the fleet. Then we've got in Botswana, you need to have Botswana registered vehicle and Botswana registered guides to operate in the country. So therefore from Maun, we've got our own fleet of Botswana vehicles, which are typically more like this. So it's a four by four, more of a safari looking vehicle, um, but it's open side. So the sides are canvas and can be rolled right up, which is quite nice. So the plus side of that, you arrive in a game reserve and, um, and, and basically from there, you've got You've got very good viewing into the into the reserve. Um, the downside of having the open sides is a little bit slower on the road itself. So it is a bit of a 
50-50, you know, what, what is the better option? We have decided a better vehicle in the reserve is, is what we're going for. So sometimes the transfer times might be a bit longer than in other vehicles, but it's worth it when you get to the reserves. East Africa, here's our East African vehicles. Uh, they're only seven seaters, whereas the others are, are typically 12 or, or over, 12 to 15. Um, so therefore, a larger group of, for example, 12 people will be two vehicles in convoy. They are hard structure uh, with a pop open roof and uh, nice big opening windows. On to the next slide. So I mentioned uh, we're moving towards sprinters. So this means we're slowly decommissioning the Fusos, which is slightly more of a truck sort of feel, maybe a little bit more of an overland look and feel. But ultimately, the feedback we've been getting from all our clients is, is that the sprinters are more comfortable. And from our point of view as well, they're also more reliable. So on all accounts, even though on occasion the client might arrive at the airport and be slightly disappointed not to have a safari vehicle, um, at the end of the tour, the feedback is consistently better in the, the sprinter, and that's why we're moving that way. So why is it better? First of all, the Sprinter is purpose-built to be a people carrier, which means we've only got minor conversions that need to be done on it. So what we actually do, we don't cut up any of the bodywork at all. We just put on large profile tires, super spring suspension, and all that raises the vehicle a little bit. So you're up higher, and obviously it deals better with the, the bumpy roads and makes the ride more comfortable. We also add in a tow bar and trailer obviously to, to take all the luggage and other equipment that we need with us. And then we add extra thick rubber seals, and that's uh, really trying to make the, the vehicle dust proof. As many of you will know, dust in, in Africa and places like Namibia, yeah, quite, quite, a, quite a problem to try and keep it out if you want. So this helps. Another element that's worth considering is that because uh, the sprinters have been made as a road vehicle, uh, it's, it's better adapted for the road. And effectively, that's where most of our, our tours spend most of the time on the open road. To put that into perspective, we put a limiter on all our vehicles so that they cannot speed. So a driver can want to go as fast as he wants, but there's a limiter on it. On the Sprinters, it's 100 kilometers an hour, whereas in the Fusos, it's 80 kilometers an hour. So straight away, we're saving a little bit of time on the road, which I think is a plus for everyone. Um, touring in Southern Africa means a lot of road time, a lot of driving, and this helps us to cut down a little bit. Within the vehicle, we do all the conversions ourselves. So at the moment, we've got 15 seats in our, uh, in our sprinters, um, reclining seats, armrests, air conditioning for, for each and every person, reading lights the same, USB charging points, a bag rack above, and, and obviously seat belts. We've also put in a good intercom sound system which doesn't say that the, um, the driver and guide are cut off from the rest of the group because they're not. It's all part of the same cab, if you want. Um, but it does mean they don't need to shout for the people at the back to hear. We've got a fridge for cool drinks, opening windows, and shades for the window as well. At the moment, we've got um, six uh, sprinters in the fleet, and there's another five on their way. The new ones that are coming online are 14 seaters instead of the 15 seats that we currently have in the, in the sprinters. And even though we go with a maximum of 12 people, we have a couple of extra seats just to give a little bit of extra space. And the new vehicles will have thicker and more comfortable seats and that recline further as well. So we're constantly looking to improve the vehicles as we go. I'm now going to quickly hand you over to Garth who's um, who's going to run you through this quick little video on the Sprinter itself. Vehicles have always been my passion um, and there's not a lot of different vehicle makes that can handle the conditions in Africa. What we've seen as a company, the evolution of, of road tripping has led us to the Mercedes all-terrain. We get a rating from every guest on the specific vehicle they were in. So that's where we've, we've been comparing the different styles of vehicles. By far, the most comfortable vehicle we, we have in our fleet has been the all-terrain Sprinter. Um, it's a phenomenal vehicle. We've, we've had the best uh, feedback from, from our clients, from our agents, from our staff here, from our guides, from our drivers. When we get to 
a, a place like Maun, for instance, in Botswana, that's when we get off the sprinters and then we get onto our, our uh, land cruisers, our open game drive land cruisers, and we go into the parks for, um, for four days, three nights on those. And that's obviously the best viewing, and that's when we need the full drive. Then when we are back onto the tar roads of Botswana or the good gravel roads of, of Namibia, then the most comfortable vehicle is the sprinter to get from A to B. This is our, our um, Mercedes all terrain, and basically, what we've done to the vehicle, as you can see, we've got uh, um, we've got off-road tyres on the, on them. We've also raised the, the suspension. We have what we call a super spring that we put on the back. You can see the, the the difference in height. And the vehicles have 15 seats in the back. We only put 12 clients uh, into into the actual vehicle. So they're very comfortable seats. And you just take your armrest and kicks up down like this. You sit here, and then you can also, um, when you're you know on a longer journey, you can kick back and you can just relax. A bit. The seats have all got individual aircon coming through here. We've got little lights and that reading lights. Nowadays, of course, with the cell phones and cameras and that, everyone wants to charge. So we have charging points um, throughout the the, the all-terrain um, bus. Our seat, our windows are open up nicely, so it's like perfect for any pictures that clients want to take. So I've been really excited. Um, late last year we decided that, uh, that I'll get more involved back in the vehicle. So it's an exciting time for me to get back involved in, in the vehicle. And also, I'm so happy with these, um, the Mercedes all-terrain, you know, and we're rolling out more of those vehicles now. Okay, so thank you, Garth, for that. So that's uh, Garth's introduction to the vehicle. So hopefully now you've got a good idea of what sort of vehicles we're using on the, the different tours. Um, to hit on accommodation, is a question we always get, what kind of accommodation uh, are, are we supplying? Um, it's very difficult to classify it in as one typical, one typical type because there is a bit of a range and it obviously depends on which area they're traveling to. So it will, it can be quite simple accommodation. If you look at down the, the bottom left, there's Bedouin Bush Camp. It's a very simple setup. It's tented accommodation, simple beds, hot bucket showers. Um, so really, really a simple setup. And that you can't say is four star or five star. It, it's not, it's kind of three star, but it, it's really what you see in the top right is what it's all about. It's lost a little bit in the bush, um, it's about open fires in the evening, the stars overhead, the animals around the sands of the bush. So it's not your classic kind of luxury, but um, it is perfectly suited and it gives an experience to those who, who actually travel there. Now, this can be combined with, you know, a, a Sable Sands will have a, a different strong points. And when you get into some, for example, some of the South African um, accommodation, maybe the townhouse hotel or the cavern, a lot more contemporary in style, maybe more stylish, more um, attention to decor and and um, and facilities. Um, but again, it suits the area that they're in. So what are we trying to get from our, our accommodation? Well, first of all, we want it to be in a good location, close to the attractions and highlights that, that we want our, our guests to visit. Standard wise, we're looking three to entry level four star, I suppose is the right kind of category. And the style then depends on the area they're in and, and obviously what's available. But effectively with the whole tour, we're trying to create experiences. It's not just about the accommodation itself, it's about experiences, but the accommodation should be adding to the experience. So a bush um, tented camp in the middle of nowhere adds to your safari experience. So that's really what we're looking for in, um, in our accommodations. What makes us different? Um, by and large, I think 25 years plus of experience. I really hope it counts for something. You know, we should have learned something over that time. Um, and I think that's, that's a strong point of, of Genman. We've got a variety of itineraries with different tour lengths, which means that we have something for everyone visiting different countries, different times a year, um, different holiday amount of days available for holiday, all those sort of things. We can cater for quite a wide range of people. The vehicles and the accommodation, I've already hit on. Um, guides, I would like to say a quick word. I do get uh, all the feedback 
after each and every tour, we get a, a kind of a summary of the feedback we get. And a, a consistent there is, is positives on the guide. So the guides, our guides are extremely good. They're people's people, they're well qualified, uh, and um, they generally add a whole add a whole load to the tour. So it's definitely one of our strong points. As you know, small group sizes, maximum 12 guests, except for the world in one country where we can take 14. Um, different language departures, English, German, and French. Our operational offices we've already touched on. Um, for those of you who are worried about our minimum four departure, we do have guaranteed departure dates. And if that minimum four is a problem, you can always concentrate on those departure dates. As soon as we've got one person booked, um, that departure then becomes guaranteed. Okay. Um, what we're trying to achieve with our, our guided group tours is exceptional value for money. So if somebody was to go and travel to Botswana as a, a tailor-made experience, it would be either extremely expensive to have a private guide or else it's fly-in, which can be very expensive as well. So what we provide is, is a value for money option for people to go and visit these countries. Um, and hopefully get a similar uh, experience to those who pay the top dollar. And we're supporting this with our agents portal, which has got updated availability and, uh, and a booking function. So it can all be done through that portal. So that's a quick introduction to, to Genman and our guided groups as a, as a, a, a company. Um, I now just wanna, look in and focus in a bit more on some of the itineraries. The first one is the Botswana Wildlife Breakaway, and that's probably our most popular itinerary. It's been going for quite a while, and we've got quite a lot of, of departures for it each year. Um, so a very popular itinerary. It starts in the Vic Falls, uh, works its way across the Caprivi Strip, down into the Okavango Delta, um, up into Moremi, across the Mahadi Hadi to Nata, up to Chobe, and then after a few days in Wangi National Park in Zimbabwe, ends at the Vic Falls again. So a lovely itinerary, 15 days. I suppose it's the best of Zimbabwe, of, um, of Botswana and, and Zimbabwe. The highlights, um, for me, the highlights of this, this tour, Victoria Falls is always gonna be a highlight. It's uh, something quite amazing to see. And it's also on many people's bucket list. So it's one of the things that needs to be ticked off for somebody visiting Southern Africa. So Vic Falls, definitely a highlight. Okavango Delta, something quite unique. So um, definitely a highlight. It's not always, a Delta isn't always a big game experience, though there's plenty of big game there. But to combine your safari uh, and your tour, which is quite a lot in a vehicle, with this time on the water and surrounded by water, which is serene and, and quiet, um, it, it's a beautiful contrast. Moremi Game Reserve. So now you're looking at, at big game, hopefully big cats um, and all the thrill of a, of a, of a real uh, safari. So that's again a highlight. Chobe National Park in the north of, of Botswana. So that's the boat-based um, safari, which I think is the, is the highlight of this. The phenomenal part about that is that the animals come down to the water to, to drink. So the animals come to you. You don't need to go out and search for them. Um, it's also ph phenomenal for photography, the reflection of the water, the sunsets with the water. It accentuates all those, those photographs and you can come out with phenomenal shots, which are great for Instagram and, and all the other social media bits and pieces. Finally, Huangi National Park, a lot more, uh, a lot more wild. Um, so not half as many people there. It's more of a, a dust and, and arid sort of area. It's in the vehicles and searching for game. So it's, it's really an authentic kind of game experience in Zimbabwe. So for me, those are the five highlights of the Botswana Wildlife Breakaway. I'm just gonna go into a little bit more detail on this itinerary and hopefully this will then sum up what, what it's all about. And we're gonna go through the activity. So what happens at each area? In the Vic Falls, we start off with a tour of the falls and a sunset cruise. So they're all included in the tour. And then there's a host of different optional activities from bungee jumping to white water rafting to bridge tours to fly to the angels, a host of other things available on request. Going across to the Caprivi, you've got a game drive Mahango game reserve. 
Now, this, this game reserve is, um, it's not huge density of game, but it's a great introduction. It's a first stop in the bush. Um, you know, plenty of planes game, maybe some buffalo, some elephant. Um, and the effectively what we're doing is we're traversing the uh, the reserve. So it's going along the, the main road, going off onto some of the, uh, the smaller paths along the river drive and things like that, looking out for game, and then we come out the other end. So it's all done in the tour vehicle. Continuing down to the Okavango Delta, and I said at this stage already, you've had quite a lot of time in the vehicle. So to get out and do a Makoro excursion, and for those of you who don't know, the Makoro is um, those traditional dugout canoes which are pulled along. The, the delta is very shallow, so you have somebody in the back who's then pulling you along the, uh, along the water channels. And gliding along the water like that, it, and the tranquility is absolutely beautiful, especially when contrasted with the time in the vehicle and the dust of the, the drier areas. We also get more time out of the, out of the vehicles. Uh, we do a bushwalk. So onto one of the islands in the, in the delta and a nice bushwalk in uh, there as well. So stretch the legs a little bit. Continuing on to, to Kwai and Moremi area, um, we got a day and a night drive on the concession. So we'll be staying in an area, for example, Bedouin Bush Camp just outside of Moremi, where it's a concession. So therefore we can do the night drives. Um, and then we go in a full day, full day game drive into Moremi itself as well. So we get kind of the best of both worlds. Crossing through the Mahari Hari Pans onto Nata, um, and there we get a visit to the Nata Bird Sanctuary. Now for me, might not be the um, the highlight of the tour, but it's a good stopover spot, and the, the bird, bird sanctuary, plenty of raptors, it's an interesting visit. From there on up to Chobe, um, where we get a morning game drive, but also the, the, the evening and sunset boat cruise, which, as I mentioned, is one of the highlights. The nice thing about the, um, you know, about the game there, again, as I was saying, it comes down to the river and you can really see quite a lot, including stacks of elephant. Chobi is the highest density of elephant of anywhere on the planet. Um, and lots of sort of the, the water based, you know, the crocodiles and the hippos, etc. Um, obviously, hippos should not be confused with zippos. And if you're not sure what the difference between those two are is, well, the hippo is a four legged, extremely heavy animal, whereas the zippo is just a little lighter. Okay, so that's um, moving on to Huangi. Uh, we got a full day game drive in Huangi, uh, and then we got a half day game drive on the concession. So again, um, Huangi accommodation is in a concession bordering the national park. Again, no fences between the park and um, and the concession, so animals come and go freely. But you do have the advantage of being able to do night drives off road, etc. And we combine that with a visit to the Painted Dog Centre. Um, the Painted Dog Center is a rehabilitation of the wild dog or the painted dog that might have been found in the area through snares or whatever else it is. So an interesting visit. Um, not a huge amount to add on this. Um, what I will point out here is under the vehicle section, it says suitable touring vehicle. And, and that's to say we can't guarantee which vehicle you will have in advance. It can depend on the group size. It, you know, we can have scheduled one vehicle to, to be on that tour. And then relatively at last minute, things have needed to be moved around for one reason or another. And suddenly it'll be another vehicle that, that'll be taking it instead. So we try not to guarantee any particular type of vehicle for any one tour. The other thing to look out for is the meals. Typically what we'll do is all breakfast will be included. Um, and then other meals will be when there isn't a kind of a, a, an easy alternative, if you want. So if we're going to a town, for example, with a, a range of restaurants, we'd rather leave people fend for themselves and choose, choose what they would like to eat. When we're in a little hotel or something, which has got quite a big menu, again, we will let people choose what they want, meal for their own account. But when we're in the bush or in a lodge where it's just a fixed menu um, so for the meals, then they'll all be included. So there is a bit of mix and matching. Also worth noticing that the lunches, um, they can be literally a picnic stop on the side of the road. On some days, there's, there's quite long distances to cover. And uh, when needed, the guide will 
organize and prepare a lunch and it could be a salad and cold meats and cheese and rolls um, or something similar and it can be done on the side of the road bring out a, a table set everything up um, and then off again to continue the journey so the lunches can be quite quick sort of picnic style uh, the dinners are usually good substantial hot dinners so that's a, a quick sum up of the um, Botswana wildlife breakaway Moving on to the second itinerary I want to present, which is the northern or and or the southern experience. The difference being the northern experience goes from Cape Town all the way up 24 days to, to the Vic Falls, and the southern experience simply goes the other way around. Um, so the northern experience, starting with Cape Town, works its way up to the Namibian border, um, into those dunes in Sosasvlei, Swakopmund, through Damaraland, um, up into Etosha, the great game viewing area of Namibia. Then across Caprivi, Delta, Chobe, and ending at the Vic Falls. If we look at the highlights, Cape Town, I'm sure many of you already know Cape Town, but um, a, a wonderful place for a holiday and, and on so many people's bucket lists, I couldn't not put it on the, the highlights um, part. Sosasvle, for me, the, the really amazing thing about Namibia is the deserts, whether it's um, the Namib, or whether it's the sort of the Damaraland rocky area, I think they're absolutely phenomenal. And Sosa's play is something quite exceptional. So that's without a doubt a highlight. Itosha, as I, as I mentioned there just a, a couple of minutes ago, the principal area for big game um, in, in Namibia. Um, combine that with the salt pans, uh, the Itosha the pans, the sunsets and the light, and particularly in the dry season, super experience. The Delta we've hit on before, and same with the, the Chobe and Victoria Falls. So there for me are the highlights of the Northern and Southern experience. Activities, so what's included in the tour? In Cape Town, uh, we've got a, a city tour, so usually it's a morning tour, including a visit to Table Mountain, weather permitting. But then in the afternoon, got a Constantia wine tasting, um, and the following day, a full day peninsula tour. So it's really a quick introduction to the city, to the mother city. On the way up to the, um, the Namibian border, we stop off at the Cedarburg, so a mountainous area, which is best known for its rooibos tea. So we do a tea tasting there. At the Orange River, which the Orange River is really the border between South Africa and Namibia in that area. It's a really arid area, um, rocky, ancient rocks, burnt um, burnt up kind of stone. It's um, haggard and rough, um, extremely beautiful. Um, there is a little bit of game around, um, typically sort of baboons is the thing you'll see or hear. Uh, there are leopard in the region, though not usually seen at all. Um, but things like reptiles, um, plenty of. When, when I was up there, I know we saw a lot of, for example, a lot of lizards. You used to see them pairing up these lizards, the two two by two, and then there was one poor lizard who was there all on his own. I was wondering what, why was he had he not got a, a mate? And then it, it kind of struck me that he probably had a reptile dysfunction. Okay, that's uh, the second of my bad jokes. Um, moving on again from uh, so the Orange Orange River is a canoe trip. Um, beautiful to go down that that river, and again, it's out of the vehicle for a little bit. Further north into the Fish River Canyon, um, supposedly the second biggest canyon in the world, beautiful viewpoints, su sunset uh, drinks over the canyon, and a visit to the I Ice Hot Springs, for those of you who want a bit of warm water. Sossus Valley is those high dunes, typically done in the morning, early morning, watch the sun rise over the dunes, beautiful lights, phenomenal photographs, and a great experience. In Swakopmund, a load of optional activities to choose from. Again, I'm not going to go through them all, but um, everything from doom boarding to boat cruises to and everything in between. Spitzkoppe is a big granite outcrop um, further north towards the Damara land area where you've got some sand rock art uh, and just a, a beautiful area to, to climb up the boulders um, and explore the boulders. On Maruru, we've got a gin tasting or occasionally a wine tasting in the area. Uh, it's a local distillery and I'm told uh, the gin is, is 
actually quite good. So it's uh, ni nice to hear. I haven't been there myself, but I believe it's, it is good and it's an interesting visit. Something I'd like to just stop on quickly is the Himba village. Um, so this visit is not, and it's important to get this across to, to some of the clients, it's not going to visit an authentic Himba village lost somewhere in the, um, in the middle of nowhere. Um, this is an experience that's been put together by the local population who want to highlight their own culture and traditions. So they have set up this traditional village um, and they come and people are able to interact with them and see what their traditional living is all about. So it's not an authentic, as I say, village um, and you're not going to meet people who live that traditional life but it isn't an opportunity to experience what the, the Himba traditions is all about. Now the guide will brief the guests before going to visit the, um, the, this Himba village, but it is occasionally we do get feedback from people who, who were expecting something different. And it's important to get across that, that this is what it is. In Itosha, uh, game drives in the, the tour vehicle, but you've got a few days to explore the, the national park. And then Delta, again, you've got the Mokoro ex excursion and the bushwalk. Caprivi, the drive in Mahangu National Park. Um, Chobi, as before, morning game drive, afternoon boat-based game viewing. And then Vic Falls, Tour of the Falls, and the Sunset Boat Cruise. So there's a quick um, sum up of uh, the Northern experience. What I will say is that this year we have introduced a 20 day, 21 day option. And the reason for that is, is that it's quite a lot of driving that southern part from Cape Town up to Swakopmund is quite a long drive and can be long days in, in the vehicle. And particularly with the roads being in very bad condition in Namibia, um, this can take time. So some people have been finding it too much. So we have offered the opportunity to arrive into Cape Town three days later than everyone else starts. So you do your couple of days in Cape Town with your city tour and peninsula tour. Then you fly up to Volvas Bay and spend a night in Swakopmund and you join the rest of the crew down at Sossel's Flay. And then you continue as normal. So please remember, this is an option. Um, please feel free to op offer it to your clients. Uh, and hopefully this way it's, it, it, um, it means that we don't get this uh, kind of complaints coming from clients about too much time in the vehicle. So there is a way around this. The world in one country is the final itinerary I want to, to have a look at. Starting in Johannesburg, down to Kruger, Eswatini, which uh, used to be Swaziland, Zululand, uh, Drakensberg, Lesotho, and then on down to Addo, Garden Route, Cape Winelands and Cape Town. So really, it's the best of South Africa in, in 20 days. Highlights, Kruger National Park, obviously the game viewing. Um, Swaziland or Eswatini, it's traditional uh, country. It's the smallest independent country in Africa. And um, yeah, so that's it's a different feel, a different atmosphere, more of an African sort of feel. So something a little bit special. Shishlui is a, is a reserve that I love. It's very scenic. It's got um, those rolling hills of Zululand, which are beautiful. And it's got a really high density of game. So the nice thing about Shishlui is that typically you go out in a game drive and you see a lot very quickly. So it's all, always a nice experience. Drakensberg and Lesotho, again, something very different. Different um, Going to Africa and going to visit the mountains might not jump out at everyone. It might not be the thing they're expecting as a highlight, but a beautiful, beautiful area. In Lesotho, the mountain kingdom, again, it's, a, um, it's an independent kingdom um, and still very much traditional and a lot of people living that traditional life. So a beautiful area to go through scenically, but also interesting um, also culturally. Garden Route and Cape Town, I think speak for themselves. A whole host of highlights. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's also again on people's bucket lists. The activities included in the panorama route, so going from Joburg towards the, the Kruger, the first stop is in the panorama route. You've got all the viewpoints in the Blyda River Canyon, God's Window, um, all, all that sort of thing is all, we'll stop in at all those and we'll visit Burke's Luck, Luck Potholes as well, which is basically a geological formation um, that's been 
basically carved out of the, the, the limestone by, by the river. Kruger, it's game drives. Um, in Swaziland, then Milwaukee is one of my favorite little um, little reserves. I think it's it's super. Um, uh, what happens here is guided walk. It's got lots of planes game, very relaxed. It's just a sort of a chill. It's got that dark red kind of African soil. Um, it's beautiful. And then we've also got the, the Chief's Homestead visit. Again, it's a cultural experience. It's not an authentic going to see a tribe living its old um, traditional lives. St. Lucia, we've got the boat cruise um, in the Isimangiliso Wetland Park. Again, lots of crocs and hippos and things like that. We've got game drives in Shishlui, as I mentioned before, high density of game, so good game viewing. Drakensberg Mountain, we've got walks. Um, it is a World Heritage Site, so that gives an extra, an extra something. Lesotho, we do pony trekking. And uh, for the Basotho people, uh, being a mountain kingdom, the tracks are often very small, uh, small little winding tracks and not full roads. So they typically do use ponies to get around. And so we follow in their footsteps and we take our guests on little outing on the ponies. Craddock is a small frontier town between sort of Lesotho and Port Elizabeth, um, 1820. Is the, the settler set up there and really was a kind of a frontier town. So an interesting visit. In my family, it's best known for being the birthplace of my great grandfather, which is just an aside, but um, it, it's an interesting little frontier town and a good stop off point between Lesotho and Addo. Addo is game drives, best known for the elephants, but it does now also have, um, have lion and buffalo and many other species of game as well. And then into the garden route, hiking in Tsitsikama, um, and then oyster tasting in, in Nisna area. In Oatsorn, a guided visit to the, the, the Kango Caves. Um, and from there, across the Cape Winelands, where funnily enough, we've got some wine tasting and ending in Cape Town with a full day peninsula tour. So that's really the, um, a quick sum up of the world in one country. Again, if you look, going through a much more, if you want to call it civilized, a more developed country, it's probably a better word for it. You see there's a lot more meal options along the way and the number of meals provided or included uh, are much less. So it's just something to keep in mind uh, as you move forward and if you're talking to guests about this, um, this tour. Okay, so that, that's a summary of the top three itineraries, the top three tours that we're selling at the moment. Um, if there are questions, please put them in the chat box and I'll, I'll get on to them now in just a minute or two. Uh, first of all, two little things I just want to point out. First of all is our, our consultant's incentive. And we are running this again for 2020. So please, if you're interested, get selling. Um, if you book 10 people or more who travel between the 1st of January 2020 and the 31st of December 2020, uh, book 10 people or more, then you can enjoy a free 14-day safari with us for you and your partner. So it's for two people, which is lovely. Um, if you do decide you want to go on a longer, join us in one of our longer itineraries, you get two weeks free of charge and the rest is then pro rata. So we can always come to an arrangement on that, no problem at all. Okay, so please keep that in mind and um, and hopefully we'll we'll see plenty of you on our one of our tours in the next year or so. I mentioned I was going to touch quickly on the Grow Africa Foundation, which is our in-house foundation. And this is something that um, I suppose I care for a lot because I'm very involved in. Um, and I've spent quite a lot of time working with the, with the foundation. For every booking we receive from, from you for the, the guided group tours, 50 Rand, 5 Euro or 5 Dollars will go to the Grow Africa Foundation. So every booking you make with us makes a difference. Um, and it all gets put back into one, the, obviously the running of the foundation, but also the projects that we run with it. And really what we would ask you guys as our agents um, to do is help us spread the word. So if you could speak to your guests or your clients about what we're doing, just let them know in advance. We find that a lot of people on tour would like to have contributed or got involved or known about some of our projects. 
And the most obvious one we have is packed for a purpose. Now, packed for a purpose, um, the benefit goes towards a uh, Dingani Primary School, which is just outside of Wangi National Park in Zimbabwe. It's a very underdeveloped community, largely, um, largely agricultural. So they're self-sufficient. They, you know, they they farm what they eat, and um, and the school is, it has got a very simple setup. So they have given us a list of things that they need in the school, such as pens, paper, copy books, and whatever else it is. And somebody, a guest who wants to get involved and to donate something can travel in their suitcase with whatever it is they want to donate that can go to the school. And the guide will pick it up from them on arrival and then we'll organize it for it to go across to the school. So that's the, the obvious one. However, there are other projects Project Pena, um, which is all to do with, with the girls in the school, girls maturing, not having access to sanitary pads and things like that, and, and education. Um, so we, we provide a solution for that. We've also got Project Rosivo, which is all about knowledge, about education, helping them with the education. And another one we're really looking to find help with is sponsoring a teacher. So that's $200 a month. If either one of your one of yourselves, your companies, one of your clients are interested in taking on something like that. We do have a whole system where we can issue with a, a badge to show your support. We'll obviously promote you on our website and we can feed you information every month as to what's happening in the school so that you can post it in your social media and, and make a bit of a, um, a bit of a hoo-ha around it. Okay. Um, also, another project we work on is this, the CWF, the Conservation and Wildlife Fund. So we support that, which is largely to do with anti-poaching in the Huangi area. So the underlying message that I'd like to get across here is please don't forget to introduce the Grow Africa Fund, uh, the Grow Africa Foundation to your clients. And if you could let them know about our website, growafricafoundation.org, let them have a look. That would be fantastic. Okay, so that's the end of my, um, my quick presentation.